Good afternoon, and welcome to the Carolina Codecast, the official podcast of the Carolina Code Conference. With me today is Liz Johnson. Say hello, Liz. Hey, how are you guys? Doing good. Welcome to the show. So hey. what are you up to these days? Um, well, I actually just started working with a new consultancy. So um, I'm working with a company called Silicon Hemisphere. And so we can shorten it to be the .sh. It looks like .sh on our website. And so it's like we even have the little like blinking little underscore. <laughs> like it's a little terminal. Oh, that's clever. It's really cool. <laughs> so we have so where um, they based on? um LA. So um really? yeah. So you um the person who started it is in LA and I've worked with them before and so we're working together again, um, just doing software consulting. Um and yeah, we're just um we do a lot of like kind of full stack development for people, agile. We also do like extreme um programming, so we do a lot of pairing test-driven development yes. and all that kind of stuff. So through that, so like through- Where are you based out of? I am based out of Dallas. So. Dallas. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, good. I'm actually gonna be in Dallas in two weeks. Great. <laughs> yep, <laughs> completely unrelated. But, um, <laughs> so, uh, so, all right, so what type of, do you all specialize in a particular language or, or stack? Yeah, honestly, I personally have done the most in Rails and um nice. ruby and rails and then python so um i've done a lot of my like content and stuff in python but um those are the two that i've had the opportunity to work in probably the most we were just together um actually a different company but we were working on a really big project um that had all sorts of different tech stacks there was we wrote there's like a optimization engine that we wrote in python and then the main app was PHP and Lar and then there was a separate app that was PHP and Laravel in the middle of it. And then we did like a modernization project. And so we ended up writing a Rails app to kind of start to modernize the PHP app, sort of like an interesting architecture. But yeah, so all sorts of things. Um, oh, and then React. So we've done a little bit of React, but I mostly have done a lot of like back end stuff. But yeah, so oh. kind of all over the place, but um, just very passionate about uh, learning new stuff and learning them as deeply as you can when you switch stuff all the time. <laughs> nice, because I, I did not expect you to mention uh, Rails or, or anything when you when you got on oh, yeah. in the first place. Because you know you, so you submitted a talk to the Carolina Code Conference in 2023 uh, that was a Python based talk, it was a Python and AI based talk called Skynet 101, um, and uh, unfortunately, weren't able to get you in this year. Really wanted to get you in. I've, and I, I know I've told you that personally, but but uh, we just as a one day conference, we just only had so many times uh, time slots available. But it looked like a really interesting talk, and I'm sorry we weren't able to get you in this year. But it looks like you were able to give that talk uh, somewhere else as well. And then I saw you give a different talk over at the Pi Data Conference as well. And so I saw all that Python background, and now now I'm a little curious you know, now that I see all the Python back and I also see that you've been doing rails and Laravel, um, not to alienate anyone in the off, off audience here, but, uh, do you have a preference on, on those three? Oh and boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it's tricky. I've worked with some truly, I mean, I worked with one, the person who I like probably learned the most like data science Python work with, he was fantastic. Um, he taught me so much and he really wrote some of the cleanest like Python code I've ever seen. Um, and he was an incredible data scientist, but also a really amazing app dev, which is um, kind of a hard combination to achieve. And so, um, but I only got to work with him for a couple months and I've worked with some also really amazing Rails devs for, I mean, a couple of years now. <laughs> um, yeah. So a couple of people um, that I've just learned so much from um and they really know rails like i've never <laughs> seen people know rails before people get very very deep into it oh yeah. my gosh <laughs> i mean it's great though i mean even like um when we would talk about things he, like the guy who i worked with who was just so amazing at it he would be like well the base camp way of doing it would be this and or you could try it this other way and like here's the history of how react came to exist <laughs> things like that like you just like know all these things um and how this other thing came to exist and so 
Um, but yeah, so he was just kind of one of those types and um, learned a lot from him. And then the guy who I work with, um, Liam, he's done a lot of rails. So, nice. you know, I, I'm a big fan and they probably swayed my opinions a little bit. Um, PHP and Laravel, I'm going to be honest, like typing the arrows is like an extra key for me. And that has really bothered me. Um, but for the most part, they're both, you know, big fan of, I can, I can hang you anyways, because I love to code. So. Yeah, it was, so I started out in the first 10 years of my career. So I was doing a ton of PHP work. Oh, yeah. um, and so I've, I'm a little, I don't do a lot of PHP work anymore. Um, but I definitely understand its strong points. And I'm, I'm a little jealous of people who are in the PHP world now, because it was really crazy. Uh, back when I was thinking, me. now you actually have a package manager. Before there were like three different places that you would have to go to to install packages from, and there was no namespacing. And so every new framework like Cake PHP or Laravel or anything like that, they would have to rebuild everything because they couldn't just import libraries because there might be a naming con. Like, you couldn't just name oh something God. database adapter. You had to name it, you know, Cake PHP database adapter. Oh, like interesting. Yeah, it was it was crazy that way. Yeah, and true. simple stuff. And and this it changed around like 2008, 2009, and they were able to get Composer in place and actually have like centralized, simplified package management, make everything a lot better and faster. But that's awesome. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I've, I've wanted to get into Python for some of the data science stuff for a long time. I've always been more of the server side web dev and a, and a bunch of different stacks. I'm, I'm a big Rails fan uh, as well. And, I, I keep trying to get into Python for some of the data stack stuff. It just, it feels so foreign to me. Um, after, after spending so much time in rails, it's just, it's strange. I've, I've read two full books on Python and I just, I just can't get my mind around. They're very different worlds. It's, it was really funny because I actually, um, when we were at the, so I went to PyCon and then I gave a, the Skynet 101 talk at PyCon. Um, but there, you know, it's kind of funny because you're like suddenly surrounded by Python developers everywhere. And I remember there was like, we're sitting in a coffee shop and there's some Python developers and they were talking about why they hate Rails and like object oriented programming is the worst. <laughs> and it was really funny to just hear. Um, but yeah, they're, I, I do, they're really different, but I do think it's interesting to do um, multiple of them. I think, I know some people who think that it's really important to just specialize in one thing. And I definitely think that at some point you should, and you should go really deep into one thing and you should probably focus on like mostly doing that thing. Um, and I think the more languages I see, the people who are really, really good at them do just kind of focus on one. Um, and they build really, really good stuff. Yeah. yeah. However, you're, you're have, dealing with the same problems in every language right. too. So if you go deep in one and you understand how to solve them in one language, that knowledge exactly. carries over. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that like seeing patterns that like seeing the patterns in something like rails and like just knowing that those exist, then you, it's maybe not always applicable in other languages, but you know that they yeah. exist. And so I know Laravel is really cool and a really nice framework. And honestly, it's like very Rails-y. <laughs> yeah. um, so it like, you can do a lot of the same things. And, you know, if you knew Rails really well and you knew good patterns, then you jump into a Laravel application and if someone hadn't put them there yet, you could probably establish them and they would work okay and be understandable Absolutely. and stuff. So I like that part about it. Nice. Well, so, you know, we've, we've mentioned that you're out in Texas mm -hmm. and you applied to speak at the Carolina Code Conference. How in the world did you hear about the Carolina Code Conference out in Texas? Because, you know, in future years, the dream is for the whole country to, to know about the <laughs> Carolina Code Conference and for it to be this big regional thing that everybody's setting their clocks by making sure they get to attend every year. But we started marketing this thing in March last year out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, Re rebooting it from from pre-covid time and oh, so nice. we I, I was shocked to, uh, to to see to see it get it get reached I mean, and and you weren't the the farthest we actually had one of our speakers was from minnesota oh nice um but uh but so how, how did you end up hearing about it in the first place yeah so once i um with 
after having like sort of written the talk and I actually wrote the talk not specifically for Python but I just wrote it because I I actually wrote it because uh at the company I was working for at the time we did like a women in engineering event and they didn't really know what to do so we kind of just had like dinner and I was like you know what I've always wanted to like when I was growing up I wanted to be a teacher actually and like all the way until I was like 16 or 17 and then my parents are both engineers and my dad was like actually maybe just like try engineering and so I ended up becoming studying computer engineering but until then I was like gung-ho on being a teacher so I was like well I think it'd be really cool to give a talk so like if we want to have this event in the office I'll write a talk for it I have some ideas and so originally it was like written for that um but then once I had it I was like, I love doing this. I love teaching people things. And I want to see if I can like give this to other people and have the opportunity to teach them and meet them and just talk about this concept. Um, so I started just like going all over the internet for <laughs> conferences that were like, I, it probably applies most to like, because it's written in Python, Python was a good choice, but um, like polyglot conferences because data science conferences um it could have worked for but um it was more around like test driven development and stuff and so if it was like a highly it's a lot of like very highly academic seeming like data science conferences where they want like yeah. research yeah. um and like a lot of and those are really cool but it just wouldn't really fit <laughs> so um that's kind of how i stumbled upon it and um yeah it just sounded like a cool one that you guys are doing it seemed like yeah I could tell it was like coming back and new but it's like super exciting that you guys are able to bring it back and stuff so yeah, I'm excited I don't want to brag but it was a pretty cool conference <laughs> sounds like it yeah now, everybody had a good time so I mean tell us about do you mind just kind of telling us a little bit about the talk without actually giving the whole talk I mean it was you know it was a uh, Skynet 101 there was a subtitle to it too yeah on, keeping your ai from getting away from you or something like that yeah yeah that's it keeping your ai from getting away from you yeah so i have a friend a couple of friends help me with the title who are like very clever and i always tell my friends that i'm not funny on purpose so they have to do that for me but um i um yeah so basically what we do in the talk is we just take a data set of movies that i got from kaggle which just has like a bunch of open data sense and data science projects yeah. and I actually like when I first pulled it, like I do like mess with the data a little bit, just to, like get into a state that's like better for going through like the walkthrough of it. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of go through a notebook and we um, clean up the data. But as we get to certain parts, we like have to write a function to like clean the column. And so the data scientist app dev person who I was mentioning before, when he taught when he first taught me like Python and data science stuff, we were working on a ETL like project because the company, our client was moving from HubSpot to Salesforce and they needed to transfer pro all their data into Salesforce. And um, he was showing me how he's like, okay, well, we have this data. Let's just write a test for this function right here in this notebook. And he just like whipped it out. And I thought it was, the coolest thing ever because you just don't really see test driven development in a Jupyter notebook. Like you don't really see it in that context. And so hmm. he had kind of come up with a way to fit these principles of test driven development into the notebook. And I just thought it was the coolest. And so, um, then you can obviously apply, you can like pull the functions out from the notebook and put them into like a utility module. And then you test it like with PyTest, the way you normally test little modules. Um, so I kind of do that. Like I show the test in the notebook and then I also show it in using PyTest. And you can also see like the benefits that PyTest provides, right? Because the test is just a function that runs over given inputs and outputs. But yeah. <laughs> PyTest has ways of like cleaning that up and making it look really nice. And the test output is a lot cleaner. Um, and so we kind of go through that. And then we, once the data is like in a state that's ready, we plug it into like we use TF-IDF and um, we basically take like a send, we use the genres for a given movie. We kind of transform to them to look like a sentence. And then we can put that through a TF-IDF vectorizer. So every description is like a vector that represents the description slash genres of the movie. And then we use cosine similarity to compare those vectors to each other. And then we can build like a movie recommendation engine at the end. 
Um, so we talked about how to test the movie recommendation engine with fixtures and why you would use fixtures and things like that. Um, but yeah, I have like a couple of slides where I kind of explain um, TFIDF and um, how it's used and stuff. So um, yeah, it's like a very simple recommendation engine, um, mostly focused on testing, but um, for people who have never been exposed to kind of those things, they're, um, they're it's, it's interesting. It's kind of interesting to see how it's actually just vectors and math. <laughs> well, so I haven't done a lot of, a lot of AI work. And so a lot of what you're, what you're talking about, there are terms that I've heard before, but oh, I don't sure. really know that well. W would you mind kind of explaining a little bit about the, the TF IDF and, and the vectors and the cosine yeah. similarity stuff just for, for yeah. sake of education? Yeah, so um, basically TFIDF is, stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. So it's okay. a way of um, measuring how important a word is in a given document. So um, <coughs> the term frequency would be how often the word shows up in a given document. And the inverse document frequency is the inverse of how often it shows up in all the documents. Um, okay. And so if you have a word like the, it's going to show up in your document a lot, but it's also going to show up in all the other documents a lot. So they kind of counterbalance each other and they're not quite as important. But if you have like a word like aerodynamics and you have a document that has the word aerodynamics a lot, well, aerodynamics will only show up in specific documents a lot. And so a word like aerodynamics will be a really important word. If you're going to start comparing your documents to each other. Um, and so what you get if you run a sentence what we did through this tfidf vectorizer is a vectorizer with like weights on certain words so this genre is really important if you have this genre it's like pay attention to that um and so it'll get like a higher weight um as a word and then once you have those vectors so vector is just like it looks like just like an array of numbers but if like linear algebra you have like two dimensional vectors so those are really easy to see um, and I'm using my hands, which won't work for a podcast, but the slides are, I, I can okay. share the slides we're, with you. We're going to have a video of it later, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, perfect. Um, if you have two-dimensional vectors, um, there's a slide on there that kind of explains cosine similarity. So there's like three two-dimensional vectors, which just look like lines. And cosine similarity is like the two lines with the smaller angle in between them uh -huh. is, are actually more similar are more similar to each other. And so you can figure out which vectors are most similar to each other with um, the cosine similarity. Um, there's like a, a library that will calculate this like matrix for you. And so when you're calculating the cosine similarity, you'll compare the vector of one word to the vector of every other, or sorry, the vector of one movie to the vector of every other movie. So eventually you end up with this like big old matrix that's like 50, thousand by 50,000 like rows, columns. Um, but then what you have is for a given movie, you have exact how similar it is to all the other movies. Now it's really sparse. And so um, yeah, you have numbers representing how similar it is to each of the other 50,000 movies. And again, it's really sparse. So actually we leave it there for all the talks I've ever done, but I was actually talking to a friend and what you would probably do is feed it into something else that would be give you like an adjacency list and would make it just like yeah. less sparse. Um, so it would take, you would give it some sort of threshold. And it says, if you're only similar to this by like, um, if the similarity score is like 0.02%, then just don't even worry about that. Take that off the list. Um, right. But yeah, so then you can use that and you just have given your movie, you just sort how similar the similarity based on similarity. And you can give like the 20 most similar movies or something like that. I, thank you for that explanation. Yeah. That all made perfect sense. Good. Um, it's, uh, I, I haven't worked with the, with the vector stuff, but when you break it down like that, I, and especially the, in the inverse, you know, if, if the, it's occurring in, in all the documents, then it's not really as important of a word. Like the, the cross weighting there, that, that helps, that actually helps quite a bit. So thank you for that explanation. For sure. Uh, I've done, I've done some basic stuff on, on word similarity for anti-spam algorithms before. Oh, cool. uh, and I just used the Levenstein distance algorithm. And I was literally comparing like this block of text to this block of text because it gives you the, 
the distance and how many letters you would have to change to make one string equal to the other. Oh, interesting. Um, and so it's it's it, it's an algorithm that occurs a, across every language, and it's it's really commonly implemented. But it's really easy to make a simple similarity algorithm. Hmm. And so for for anti spam purposes, if one person was sending the same or very similar messages over and over, you could just you could limit the amount of, of things that you were searching to basically their most recent like fifty th um, fifty texts or submissions or anything like that, just to see how similar it was to the other ones. But uh, probably not that efficient of an implementation for something broader like this. And so getting sure. into the, getting into the vectors and understanding that it actually works that way is, is pretty cool. I might have to go deeper on it. If I wanted to go deeper on that, where would I actually look? What would be a good place to learn? Yeah. So um, I actually learned a ton from, and I'd have to look up the exact one, but there's a Google course. Um, that's like, I think intro to machine learning or machine learning. Um, I just looked it up the other day. Um, but yeah, because people, you know, with all this AI stuff, it's like people can interact. I think there's like this, it's a little bit tricky because if you're just interacting with chat GPT and you're learning how to interact with chat GPT, in my opinion, you're learning how to interact with an API. Um, the same way you would learn how to interact with like the Salesforce API or like the Okta API or something like that. Right. Um, and so it's a little bit, I have a hard time when people are talking about like, oh yeah, we can build a model for you or like we can build this, like you're not, you're, you're actually just talking to chat GPT and you're figuring out how to talk to chat GPT, um, which is still like a worthy, you know, pursuit. Like if this is a technology, let's learn how to use it. Um, but when it comes to like building your own models or if companies want their data to not go out to chat GPT and you got to like, yeah. how's your own model? Um, understanding some of the fundamentals I think are really important. And so um, I just, the reason I was looking it up is because I was recommending it as like a good class to kind of understand. Yeah, just some of the different fundamental ideas in machine learning models, um, because like, you know, you have like a node and this node does this thing and then you just give it, and then all of a sudden there's like a thousand nodes <laughs> doing the same thing and it's more preferred and like it can give you recommendations and stuff. And so um, yeah. I think that, uh, I'll have to look it up, but Google has some really good like free courses um, based on like intro okay. courses, but yeah. You don't have to find it right now, but if you can <laughs> find it after the show, I'll, I'll be happy to include the your recommended Definitely. links in the show notes. Perfect. All right. So, um, you know, outside of just all things work and, and data and Python, I mean, what, what, what else are you doing these days? What do you like to do for, for fun? What is there to do in the Dallas area and the tech community over there? Are there a lot of good meet, uh, meetups around Dallas and are you involved with that at all? Yeah. So Dallas is like, um, a little bit tougher, um, tech wise. I haven't had, um, I mean, if people listening to this, know if good tech meetups, you should let me know. Um, but I know Austin has a ton of them. So Austin's like a few hours away. Um, so I've been to like, I've been to a couple startup events in Austin and then, um, I'm actually going to try and go to like some more meetups. Um, this next month they have like a couple on the same day and so i can kind of like drive down go to a couple of those um so those are i mean those are really fun i love meeting new people and just kind of talking tech and all the new things with them so um and then besides we're, that we're very focused on promoting meetups on this oh, good. <laughs> not on, on this podcast but you know with the conference itself is oh yeah uh, sort of a parallel goal of getting the conference going around here was that we had a really good meetup scene in Greenville, South Carolina area where we are prior to 2020. Mm. And of course everything died. And so we're, we're trying to use a lot of the momentum around the, the conference and everybody's kind of desire to get back out there and start being around people again uh, to get a lot of those meetups going again. And so whenever we can find opportunities to cross to either cross promote or let people know about meetups in the area, no matter where they might be, be living, um, try to take, to take the opportunity to do it. The, the long-term goal is that eventually we won't have an open call for papers anymore. We want to eventually be able to say, uh, to have meetups recommend speakers for us oh, cool. that have gone to their meetups. And that's, you know, it'll take a while to get there. But once we have enough meetups that are, that are regularly involved with us around, and we're, we're trying for regional at least, to uh -huh. not just be Greenville focused, but we want to be Southeast, uh, Southeast focused in general. Um, if we can get and get that pipeline going. So that's why I'm specifically asking you about meetups and, and your sure. area and that type of thing. 
That's awesome. Yeah, that's such a great idea. Yeah, I think there was, um, there's a place in Austin called Capital Factory, and a lot of the meetups I've been seeing are uh, meet there. It's basically, I think it's like a co-working space, but then they also have, okay. um, like, uh, opportunities. I think there might be, part of it might be one of, there might be a startup accelerator type deal that's associated with it, um, and, um, yeah, so there's like a Python meetup and a data science meetup or a data meetup um, that kind of happened from there. Um, and I haven't been to it yet. So I'm going to go next month because it's a little bit of a drive. And then I have little kids who keep me busy. Um, and so, um, but yeah, I think they're really cool. It's like a really cool idea. And I actually um, just recently, so before... I was at my last job, which I was at for two years. I was actually just home because I had um, little babies. Um, so I was actually off for like, I was doing Java actually a long, long ago. And then I was off for like three and a half years. Um, and then they, I kind of like found my last company, started by doing interviews for them and then like part time. And then I started working for them. So all that to say, I've only been back at work full time for about two years and I'm just like now kind of getting my feet underneath of me and like with all the consulting and all the different languages and all the different tech stacks. Yeah. Um, and yeah, starting to look for like more opportunities to like do meetups or like speak at conferences or like build content and things like that. Cause I've always thought it was so cool that um, it wasn't really on my radar for a while. So. Yeah. It, it's a lot of fun when you get young kids, you know, <laughs> it, it really throws things off. Like one of the reasons that I that I actually started speaking at meetups around here was that I would try to go to meetups, but something would always come up. And if I was committed to speak at the meetup, I couldn't cancel. Mm, so yeah. I had to go either way. And I, I joke with people that I've probably spoken at more meetups than I've attempted and not spent than I've attended and not spoken at. Yeah. Just because I always ended up having to find a reason to cancel for one reason or another. Because stuff comes up when you got oh, yeah. I've got two kids of my own. They're fourteen and twelve now. But um you know, for the, for the earlier years, there's especially, you know, up till, till they're about five years old, it, it can be a blur. Oh, yeah. juggling everything you're trying to keep up with. And, uh, you know, I, I always joke whenever any of our friends would, uh, would have their first kids, like, well, we'll see y'all in five years. <laughs> it's, it is just head down, just getting through everything for that. And then, and then things smooth out and get a little bit easier when the kids are in school and they can like walk around on their own and then oh, yeah. them buckle up, uh, buckle up in the car by themselves and stuff. It's a whole different world. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, 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 everything gets a lot easier now, you know, my, my oldest is uh, just started high school and now he's getting at that age where not only does he not require any attention, he doesn't want any attention. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so, so wild. Uh, yeah. So how old are, you, are yours now? Mine is still pretty little. So three and a half and five and a half. So we kind of got yeah. in, I went, started going back to work. Um, the youngest was 18 months. Um, so we did like daycare for a little bit. And now he's just in a preschool, which honestly remote work has been amazing because he plays oh, yeah. by himself pretty well. And like between my husband and I, my husband only has to go in three days a week. And so um, we can, he, our youngest basically is three and a half, but he only goes to preschool three days a week. Um, but the other two days he kind of just chills with us. But yeah, definitely my um, older one is five and he's in kindergarten. And I can see how different it would be because like he's just going to be in school all day anyway. <laughs> like you're not like missing this time. Like he would be gone. It's like feels yep. more normal and definitely more comfortable than it would have, you know, you know, a few years ago. So, um, but yeah, it's like the whole world is like, opening up again I'm like oh wow I can like go do things but that's also why like Austin actually is a little bit better because if it was a if there were meetups in Dallas and I had the option to bail last minute I would almost always bail last minute oh, because yeah. they would be like oh mom you just don't go like can you just not yeah, okay I guess <laughs> yep that is that is exactly what happened. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm finally starting to go to more meetups again Thanks to thanks to a lot of this stuff, but hey. um, the remote meetups were were actually kind of good for that when people tried oh, yeah. to go remote, but mm -hmm. the attendance just wasn't there. Some yeah. of them thrived with it. Mm -hmm. you know, we actually had one here locally. There's a, a group I think actually just published this interview um, on uh, November 13th. It was uh, the Upstate Linux or Upstate Carolina Linux User Group, and so they went fully remote, 
and they merged with a Linux user group in Columbia, mm. South Carolina capital. And, uh, and so they got bigger because they were remote. They figured, well, we don't just have to do this locally now we can. And so they would alternate speakers between the two groups and, and it actually worked really well for them. And right. so now they, they alternate hosting in person and everybody else will tune in remote, even though they're back to in person now. And, uh, but, uh, but a lot of the other ones, like the, the Ruby meetup and, Eli and Elixir meetups that were around here and stuff, almost all of them just kind of collapsed and yeah. uh, they're, they're coming back now slowly, but surely it's just a matter of that consistency. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely uh, all the like groups and stuff is just so hard to like be remote fully. I mean, I even like, I mean, I work fully remote now and I have for the last couple of years, but any chance I had to go to California, like I've found ways to like, even like I was just traveling a lot just to like for the sake of visiting. So I would pay for it myself and I would figure out how to do it really cheap. Like I had yeah. gotten like a trip to California for three days. I'd like gotten it like under eight hundred dollars sometimes. It was <laughs> just like not bad. So um yeah. And so I uh, but just like to be around people and be in person with the people you're working with, it just like makes such a big difference. So it, um, it does. Makes it does. And, and it's interesting seeing the balance of it too. There are definitely some people who, who very much prefer working remote and, and others prefer to be in person. Yeah. And I, I went through this weird balance. Like I, I told you earlier, I mean, I've been doing this, I've been remote for 11 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it was, was interesting kind of how it happened in the first place that I, I prefer being in the office when I'm with the people that I'm actually working with. Yeah. So, but I, I tried going into co-working spaces and stuff and, and I like them at times when I have interaction with the other people in the co-working spaces. But if I'm just going into a building to put on headphones and ignore everybody, yeah. I may as well stay home. And, uh, and the farther away I'm, if, if I'm at home then I can take advantage of my lunch break to go run errands, yeah. and I can be, you know, kind of more productive with my time and stuff. And it's, uh, it ended up just being like a, it was easier to juggle life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot to juggle life when I was remote. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's a very interesting balance. I'll That's never forget I, when I first started working right out of school, my first job, my first boss actually mm -hmm. told me, uh, don't miss meetings, don't miss deadlines. Otherwise I don't care when you're here. And right out of school, I was like, wow, this is awesome. I get to, to work remote. And this is back in you know, 2004. Okay. And you didn't see the remote thing that often at the time. For three weeks, I went in one day a week, uh, and after three weeks, I was like, I, I can't take this anymore. And I just I went full time to the office after that because I just needed to be around people. I needed to to learn from people I was working with, and yeah. And, uh, but now I couldn't even imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a good life balance, especially with kids. Um, yeah. Just to be able to ability to like, because I don't know, they end up home a lot more than you'd expect, you know. And yeah. it's nice to be around. Like yeah, yeah, days off. But I will say the working with people, the last client I was working for, um, they would have these, uh, they're based out of Columbus. So a bunch of, a bunch of us would um, fly to Columbus, like before certain deadlines or like things we were trying to get done, they would fly a bunch of us there and, um, or we would fly there and we'd all meet up there and work on stuff together. And so we would have like a stand up and then we would like recap at the end of the day. And like, we were all working with the people that were around us. Like we weren't really on a ton, full ton of zoom calls. Um, we were just kind of all working in person on the same thing, driving towards the same thing for Friday. And that was awesome. <laughs> I haven't done that in years. Um, so that yeah, was I really cool. <laughs> oh God. That actually that sounds a little bit like a different world almost. <laughs> right and so and it's fun because these people they're, they're a client and we're all over the u.s so like really we never yeah. would have met each other otherwise um so it's like really cool opportunity i'm really glad they decided to do that nice. and so uh, so are you from the dallas area i'm not actually so i'm actually originally from chicago ish oh wow chicago suburbs yeah my um my husband and i we met um my husband's from central illinois we met in college and we actually got married in college we got married really young um, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, so he, we were looking for jobs and, um, sometimes central Illinois people have this thing against Chicago where they just like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to be fair, it's a very different place from the rest of the state, but they sort of like rule the state, um, because there's so many people there. Um, and yeah, so, so he was, board, go. <laughs> yeah, so he was like, not about moving to the Chicago suburbs, but I wanted to live in the suburbs and he was really into Texas. His mom is from Texas and he used to always visit. And so to him, it's like a very special place. 
So people ask how we ended up here and I always figure it's that because we both got jobs um, in Dallas, but then also I think the location was sort of like this, like still the suburbs, but not Chicago. And we actually did move back to Chicago for a year after my oldest was born. But other than that, um, it was really expensive and cold. So we moved back to Texas. <laughs> and so we've now been here for like eight years, which is kind of crazy. Oh. Um, oh. Yeah, so it's good. Well, let me let me steer us back towards a little bit of tech here. Um, yeah. So, uh, so you're obviously very well versed in the Python data science bits. Uh, at PyData, you gave a talk on TDD with uh, with your your CI/CD system. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that one a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So basically, what I did for that talk is I took the the old other talk, and that talk became like the first ten minutes of the next one. So. Okay. We still start with the data set. We still build our recommendation engine, but we do it really fast because this was for data scientists. They probably know what TFIDF is and like they know how to use these. If not, like they're familiar enough with the libraries, they can't figure it out. Right. Um, but what I really wanted to do is like, okay, well, now you have these tests. How do you make sure that they get used properly to like actually help you and support you? Um, and this is something that came from the really good Rails dev I was mentioning before. And he, besides being amazing at Rails, he knew GitHub really well. So mm -hmm. All these different things you could do in GitHub, you knew all these different libraries, all these different checks you could put in place. Um, and he had like one of our GitHub checks would like um, do like schema checks on all our migrations to make sure that like they were gonna, you know, that you could spin up the database from, from nothing and it would my it would look the same as what it does in production so that you could you know there's not discrepancies in your local and production so all mm -hmm. that to say he he knew a lot of that and so watching him use that was really a really great experience because what he did was he kind of architected and greenfielded this new app that was going to help modernize the old one and he did it in such a way where he just knew where people get tripped up normally and where greenfield apps start to stall and so he kind of put a bunch of checks in place to prevent that from happening um even before they started happening which was the coolest um and so one of the things is that like you know you can build a whole suite of tests but if they're not running in a pipeline people don't run them and they don't use them and if you know um yeah they're not used properly then it's not going to work so i wanted to go all the way from the initial data set to like a glue job that prepares the data to be used in the recommendation engine. So we start with a notebook, we get our recommendation engine, we move it into like a Python module or just like a script. And so what you could do is you could just copy all the code from the notebook into a Python script. Okay. Um, but then I kind of talk about like, okay, well, why do we not want to do that? Because I've the one that we do in the talk is pretty small, but I've seen this happen. And the Python script is like a thousand lines or something, you know, and it works and you copy each line over, you know, it's going to work by the end. Um, but it's really hard to maintain. So another developer coming in who has to touch it, it's really overwhelming. They don't know if they broke anything. Um, so we talk about how you can break up this giant script into smaller pieces and then we test those pieces. Um, but then, you know, you have all these like modules, these utility modules that support the script. You don't just have all the code in the script anymore. So right. in order to use those modules in AWS Glue, you're going to have to build a Python wheel. So we use a tool called Poetry and we um, mostly use it for it's like as a build tool. And we build the Python wheel with that. I talk about like some things that at least caught me when I was making it. And um, yeah like can kind of trip you up um, and how you can use that. And then we build a GitHub pipeline. So you are probably familiar, but with GitHub, you can do like dependent actions. So oh, our audience might not be, so, so go ahead. And, oh, okay, and cool. I've, I've spent plenty of time. In okay, this, great. So. <laughs> But I'm, I'm, I'm Googling some stuff behind the scenes over here, like AWS Glue, <laughs> which I've never heard of. It looks like it's oh, yeah. AWS's uh, ETL service. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's awesome. And we do like the simplest version of a glue job that you can. So we do a Python shell script, but if you have like bigger data, you have to use like spark jobs, um, which I haven't done too much of. I just know that that's like the big data version. Um, but yeah, so GitHub workflows, you, you know, most people have probably seen them, but basically they can, you can set them up so that if you open a PR to main, um, you can't merge the PR until all the GitHub workflow checks have passed. Right. So the script runs and it returns with a non or with a normal exit code saying that it's all good to go, turns green, and then you can merge, right? And so you can set them up in such a way that they're um, dependent. Um, so if your test, you could have like a build step that builds the Python wheel, which is what we do in the talk. And then you can have a test step that then runs your test. So if you build, if you're, module doesn't even build, you probably don't need to run the test because you're stuck, like your build's not working. So you have to fix that first. And then the final step in this pipeline that I build, so it goes build, test, and then upload. So you can use the um, the pipeline to actually like just run the AWS S3 upload script. And so once your build passes, then you can run your tests. And once your tests pass, you can run your upload script. But you definitely don't want to run your upload script at the same time you're running your tests because you know if your tests fail, then you just uploaded something that's broken. So okay. um, you can get into some really complex logic with these CI/CD <laughs> pipelines and the various cases, but once it's there, it makes everybody's life a lot easier. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And then the other thing that I learned that was cool that I think is a little bit newer is that you can um, reuse workflow files. So you can have a yield, like a, instead of having to write your build, test and upload in like all one file, you can separate them into separate file, workflow files. And then you can actually almost like import them into a main workflow. And so I kind of show um, how to do that to sort of avoid the like copy pasting of like, the build step, if you only want to run the build step on a different um, trigger than the whole like process kind of thing. Um, and then last, we just show the Terraform for the AWS Blue Job and just like some things there. Um, and then that's pretty much it. But yeah, we kind of go beyond the notebook and talk about like, okay, now you have the notebook and now you have your script. How do you actually get this to like a production ready, scalable, thing that you can use. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool. So do you find yourself uh, ever, you know, I, I know you've been doing a lot of Rails for the last couple of years. Do you find yourself doing any of the data science stuff in Rails or just calling out to the Python stuff from Rails or do you, or how do you end up combining these tool sets that you've, that you know? Yeah. So um, the, I actually, there is um, another consultancy called Test Supple. Who I've worked with a couple of from them and I was looking through their blogs and they actually have someone on their blogs um, who's doing who's doing some really cool stuff with um, Ruby and data science work um, okay. and so that is like awesome I have read a little bit of it but I haven't actually tried it yet um, so I because I know Python and I know Rails I just use them for the two separate things and so like right. If I needed an engine, I'll write that separate. Like, you know, use Rails is like more of an ORM kind of API thing. Um, but yeah, um, so I haven't really combined the two yet. Mm. Um, but I have seen people trying to, and I think it's a really cool idea because I don't know if like some of this is going to get bigger and be used more often. Yeah, you've got a lot of maturity in that Python yeah. data science ecosystem. It, it's interesting to watch because I'm, I'm a big Elixir fan myself. Mm. And they've made a lot of headway on the data science stuff cool. with, you know, with a, a, a an upgrade of Jupyter Notebooks called LiveBook oh, cool. uh, and, and a whole lot of combined technology to to try to help you do distributed. I mean, because Elixir and Erlang are basically they're made for, for high concurrency, highly distributed across clusters of stuff. Um, trying to to do a lot of this data science work, and I, I hear good things from it, but, it, but it's interesting because they're they're rebuilding the entire ecosystem. It seems like in the, in the way that they do it. And it, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not against reinventing the wheel. That's how you get better wheels. Yeah, but uh, uh, it, it's just I'm always curious to to hear how how people use the, these overlapping, very specialized data sets. Yeah. Got, I've got one interview with uh, that I haven't published yet um, 
with a guy named Eric Burden, who um, he, he talks a lot about doing work with R and Julia uh, and uh, you know, just for, for all the matrix math stuff as well. And it's, it's a fascinating world. I haven't spent a lot of time in it. I've spent tons of time doing like intense SQL queries and everything like that on the, on the database. Right. I haven't gone much farther than that. Yeah. But it's really, really, really interesting work. Uh, so yeah. Uh, anything else that you would like to, to talk about while we're on here? I don't really have a good segue at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think, um, I think, uh, the content stuff has been really cool. Um, and it's kind of newer for me, um, to start publishing some of it. Um, I, uh, also besides doing talks, I have a couple articles like on my medium account, um, mm-hmm. talking about like Python and then, um, we have a couple on our new website, um, for the new consultancy that I'm working for, um, which I can give you the website for as well. Um, yeah, feel free. I mean, yeah. so, some of the links I'll, I'll be happy to include them in the show notes too. Perfect. Um, and then I also, um, write for free code camp, like I'm a writer for free code camp, which I think is just like one yeah. of the coolest things, um, just the way they, um, kind of structure this stuff. It was really, really valuable. Um, even like getting started, like, so in order to write for them, you have to have like a few articles already. Um, but yeah, once they you actually requested to publish something that I had already published on my blog one time. Years oh ago. yeah. Uh, and that's the only thing I've ever written for them, but it was, it was cool to see the experience. Yeah. It's like really cool. Cause then they have like, um, her, I think her name's Abby. She's like, their editor is like, she's really great. And so she's really good at, I don't know. It's just, a, it's just great to have another set of eyes on it, but like, she's very good at quickly editing your work, which I think is like definitely a skill (laughs) most people like I have a lot of people read my articles usually but a lot of people you know like they get hung up on certain things because they have opinions on this and it's like Mm -hmm. what I really need to know is like does this make sense or not and um not that like everyone does but um she's just really good at like reading them and being like this paragraph actually needs another paragraph (laughs) and that's it like you just need to explain this specific thing a little bit more um so that's been really cool it's really helpful especially when I first started writing because like getting her feedback on them really started to help me write better um which is really cool so it's a cool writing on technical subjects is always a a little bit of a minefield too because on the one hand you want it to be succinct enough so that people can read it and not have to invest their entire day on it on the other hand if you've read anything on the internet, you know how the debate and opinions are going to go. And you almost feel like you have to pre-answer every single possible <laughs> question in your, in your stuff. And so I end up, I always lean more towards the ridiculously long article style because I'm trying to cover like every single case that I know somebody's going to argue about. And then by <laughs> then I probably lost them anyway, so it didn't matter, but it's just, I can't help myself. <laughs> Well, once you send that, and that's something that's a little bit newer to me too, is these like uh, engineering logic battles. <laughs> as I've like become moved more of out of like a, as you know, the last couple of years, I've moved you know, more out of like a junior position to like, and I have my own opinions. Well, yeah. when you start to have your own opinions, everyone has different opinions. <laughs> and mm-hmm. like that was like a, it's funny because to, to a lot of engineers, it, I feel like they don't, they don't, there's not a lot of like emotion in it. It's more just, usually it's more just like logic debates. It's just funny um, to me. And so that was something I had to get used to um, as I moved into that kind of a role is just like, yeah. oh, like, are we fighting? He's like, no, we're not fighting. <laughs> we're just yeah. logically debating something. Um, but yeah. And then you start to think like that because you start to think like, okay, they're going to say this and then I'm going to say this. So I'm going to put this part in here to address this thing and rebuttal this, even though no one's actually fought me on it yet, but I know that someone's going to. And so, yep. yeah, it's funny how you like start to think like that. But And the thing is when you're in an environment like that, though, it makes you really thorough in the decisions that you're trying to make because Definitely. you have to have thought through all that stuff before you even bring it up. Otherwise it's going to just go completely sideways. Totally. There was a team I was on, um, I can't remember how long ago it was. It was at least six or seven years ago, but it was a, it was a group of like five of us. There was an architecture team uh, for this company and we were talking through all these different possible solutions. And anytime anyone new got to sit in on our meetings or there was somebody from outside who was bringing something to us to discuss, they were like leaning off to the manager off the side. Like, do we need to call HR? Is this <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and they're like, no, that's just how they work. It's, <laughs> it's just it hard is. to talk about everything. But, the only uh, problem is if you start talking to other people in your life like that about other things. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, gotta have, you have to have walls. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. I think, but to your point, I think even like writing and stuff is like when I'm about to publish something, like I will read the docs more thoroughly than I've ever read the docs on that thing, you know, because it's like, I don't want to say this wrong. And there are, there is documentation on this. And so if I'm going to say that this is what this thing does and this is how it can be used, I like better be right. Um, so I've always yeah. told people who are like considering like writing publishing more content or things like that. It's like, do it because it's like a really good learning experience to like mm -hmm. try and like, teach someone something you have to know it really deeply yourself um so I thought, I thought the best way to learn is to teach yeah right or, that was something that my seventh grade teacher used to tell me <laughs> and, golly it is absolute truth um Definitely. and so that's that's one of the reasons i got into to writing some stuff myself too is just i would learn something really deeply and i, I need to tell someone about this and then you start yeah. writing it and you're like okay well i also have to cover that and that and that, and that, and that <laughs> for everybody else but uh, but then yeah. but it gets it out of my head. Like I'll, mm -hmm. I I write when I can't stop thinking about something, and I just need to clear my own head. Yeah, and that's that's where it all came. And same thing with the talks. It's like once I've given a talk one time, I'm like I'm good. I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> makes but, sense. Uh, yeah, I, 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 that is that's good to hear. Getting into getting into the content writing and presentation stuff is 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 very much a, a great thing. And it's when you get into those logical debates too. Um, I, I read a quote on Hacker News earlier today or yesterday or something like that. Like you can't logic some uh, somebody out of an emotional stance, uh, and it's it's interesting when you start getting into like developer discussions. Everybody loves benchmarks, mm -hmm. and people will attack the validity of the benchmarks. They'll get into the logic of whether you know this was a real world scenario or not. But you can look at the numbers and say this is better than that definitively in this case. Uh, because we we have numbers to prove it, mm -hmm. but when you get into something like, you know, as, as somebody who spent a lot of time with Rails now, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Rails. I keep coming back to Rails. It's not my favorite language for everything, but it is so productive at everything you do with it that it is hard to go. I'm going to take the long road and use this other language, even though I know it'll run faster or it might be more efficient or something along those lines. And when you try to communicate com to communicate productivity benefits to developers who really like another language, they get really defensive. And so at one point I, I used to manage a, a Python team mm -hmm. when I didn't know a lot of Python. Uh, I, was, I was managing it more along with managing several different, different aspects uh, of it, you know, along kind of combining the DevOps stuff with just managing the developers and keeping them sane with all of the, the product goals that need to be done. But, uh, one of my favorite things to do was whenever they told me something was really hard, I was like, well, in Ruby, you would just do this real quick. And they would get so defensive by it, suddenly <laughs> they figured out a way to, to get it done in Python. Even if it was really hard, the, the idea that you could do something easier and faster in Ruby really upset them. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry for all my all the Python devs that are listening right now, but it works. <laughs> there you go. It was, it was a strange motivational technique to talk about their Python. But um, yeah. Anyway, anything else you'd like to close out with? I think we're just about at time. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think that's uh, probably all I got. Um, I guess yeah. the last thing that we've been doing recently is just kind of like at a new um, consultancy. We're just also kind of getting into the world of like focusing on like how you deliver value to people and like how do we make sure that like that's that's kind of new to me. You know, I was working for a consultancy before, but they just kind of handed me. The work and they were like go do this and then it's kind of a different perspective than um kind of a newer place where um you know uh you need to figure out you know how you kind of talk to how do you, how you determine if whether or not you can provide some of the values so if you're talking to like potential clients and things like that um how you kind of figure that out and so um kind of with the content it's like okay i think this can provide value to people so i'm going to publish it and so now we have this whole thing where it's like i think i can come to you and provide you value but like how do um i determine that and like how do we find the right place to go so um yeah. that's kind of an interesting adventure yeah. <laughs> yeah so but yeah
Yeah, a lot, a lot of balance and trade-offs and opportunity costs and, and other factors that you've got to start weighing to, to have those conversations. But you know, ultimately, one of the best things you can do from a consultancy standpoint is tell people, I'm not the best person to help you with that. Mm-hmm. And you know, just knowing that you can do that and having the discipline to be able to do that, that you, every single person that you talk to is not your client. Mm, yeah. and, uh, and realizing that is, is tough. Anyway. Thanks for coming on today. I uh, really enjoyed having you. I learned a lot during this. I, uh, I hope you had a good time. Indeed. Um, so, uh, and I got to give my my uh, weekly shout out to Herd Media. Thanks to Herd Media for helping me get the this podcast underway and, and continuing to advise and on the production here. If you're ever starting a podcast and need quality production, reach out to Herd Media right here in Greenville, South Carolina. This has been the Carolina Codecast. Thanks. Thanks.